realizing I got nothing left to lose in my actions, I let my hands become weapons, my teeth become weapons, every bone and muscle and fiber and ounce of blood become weapons, and I feel prepared for the rest of my life. Today we're screening Wojnarowicz. Oh shit, I, I should have had that record. He was a super important artist, writer, thinker, an activist. As each T cell disappears from my body, it's replaced by 10 pounds of pressure, 10 pounds of rage. He fought against the system at the height of the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. And I can't believe I had no idea who this guy was until watching this film. A bunch of us went to jail. David escaped. Finally crafted using Moynarovich's own recordings, phone messages, and writings. It's a film that needs to be seen. Stick around after and we'll talk to the filmmaker. Directed by Chris McKim, here's Wojnarowicz. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two. Testing, 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 testing. Test, test, test. We rise to greet the state, to confront the state. When I was diagnosed with this virus, it didn't take me long to realize I'd contracted a diseased society as well. separate politics from AIDS. Four, six. Here's what's happening as we update our top stories. East Germany today took down the Berlin Wall. Bottom line is I may be dying of AIDS in America in 1989. Isn't that political? I don't have health insurance and that I don't have economic access to adequate health care. Isn't that political? And to try to pretend that the subject of AIDS did not have a political tinge to it is ridiculous. Who is that? John McKenzie is putting this up together for Peter something of uh, World News tonight. Peter Jennings? Yeah. You mean like national news? Yeah. Oh shit, I, I should have had that record. Are you recording all of this today? Yeah. You mean you're gonna make art out of it, huh? Yep. Tonight a Manhattan art exhibit about AIDS is losing a lot of federal money because of what will be shown in the exhibit. The chairman of the NEA states, we find that a large portion of the content is political rather than artistic in nature. Some of the content includes criticism of Cardinal O'Connor, Senator William Dannemeyer of California, and Senator Jesse Helms for their support of the new restrictive law. Thank you. This weather is certainly no work of art. So are you going to do Nightline tonight? Uh, I somehow just can't see it. I mean, I... You think you'd put on a shirt if you did? Well, that's what I was thinking of already, my wardrobe. I mean, I, if I did, I, I might wear a ski mask. And, uh, you know, carry a bucket of gasoline. From Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. The art of David Wojnarowicz has recently been at the center of controversy because the subject matter deals with sexuality and AIDS. Let's talk about how you started making art. Now, you came from a really rough family background. Your, your father abused your mother. You ended up in an orphanage for a while. Then your father kidnapped you from the orphanage. And you've written that you later threw yourself into sex and you became a hustler for a while. How did you start making art? Whatever work I've done, it's always been informed by what I experienced as an American in this country, as a homosexual in this country, as a person who's legislated into silence in this country. One, two, three, four. Civil rights or civil war. I'm not going to be polite and fuck these people that want me to be courageous. There's no expression in that other than silence. As each T cell disappears from my body, it's replaced by 10 pounds of pressure, 10 pounds of rage. I tried very hard to be normal and tried very hard to be accepted. 
On some level, it's a terrific waste of time. Born a robot? Born a robot. Born a robot. Fuck you, faggot fucker. David was two years younger than me, and Pat was sort of the big girl. I don't remember him ever aspiring to do art or to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything else. And I think we were probably too consumed with trying to survive at any given moment than to be worried about what was going down the road. Dave and I used to go out in the woods to get away from my father. He was horrific when he was drunk. I grew up in a tiny version of hell called the suburbs. I had a father who brutalized both his first and second wives with physical violence. Any signs of life in the family he supported with his paycheck from his job as a sailor was met with extreme violence. In the universe of the forest, I didn't think of what it felt like as a five or six year old being dragged down a basement stairs to have my head and body hit with a dog chain or a sawed off chunk of two by four. In my home, one could not laugh, one could not express boredom, one could not cry, one could not play, one could not explore, one could not engage in any activity that showed development or growth that was independent. Life on the streets got really rough, and David ended up in a halfway house. He had not graduated from high school at that point. When he finally went back to school was when he discovered Rambo and Janae. They both are outlaws and rebels, and he always identified with outsiders his whole life, and these were the outsider writers. Testing tape journal one, two, three. Oh, well, looks like we ended up in Jamestown, North Dakota, past the halfway mark between East and West. <laughs> like something out of an old west picture. Dusty roads, and old board buildings, little family houses all around you. Great stretches of sky, long lines of trains. And the tracks, when you look at them, just shimmer. It looks like thousands of little animals running across. Then there's the constant flapping of bird wings, like Occasionally you hear a train whistle miles away, but the trains never seem to get here. That was doggy French for uh, high pin heads. Uh, I'm just sitting here in my sister's apartment using her tape recorder, trying to figure out what the hell to say. <laughs> As far as publishing, uh, forget it. The last woman that I sent the manuscript to, this woman in Black Sun, La Soleil Noir, called me up like after a month and told me she wanted to return my manuscript. You know, she said that the people in the monologues were wasted lives and it was a waste of time to write about them. I mean, everything she said just reinforced uh, my belief of its importance. It's like that, I mean, it's like the, the galleries too. The stuff that I work on takes so long to do that the price that I'd have to ask if I was gonna make a living off is just too much, especially since her tastes gravitate towards uh, Woolworthian prints. I've been having like just tons and tons of dreams of America and American road and highways. I really miss energy in New York. Paris gives you a sense of strange security, which doesn't make me happy. So I guess I'll say goodbye here. Au revoir, bonjour, bonne journée, bonne nuit, bonne de, bye bye. Uh, 
It's Arthur Rambeau in New York. I got a job in an ad agency for all of two and a half weeks, operating a staff machine. Then I ended up doing all my own work. I sat in the face of Arthur Rambeau, blew it up, and made a flat mask. And I had him riding subways, wandering all through the warehouse, hustling at Times Square. David was taking Rambeau through what was his world in New York. I grew up as a hustler. I grew up hustling in Times Square and all sorts of places all around New York. Men of all different descriptions. Felt that home was so unstable. My mother would be screaming her head off. I would run away, whether it was for a night or whether it was for months. I'd just take off and end up being picked up by some guy in the sun or, you know, whatever. By the time I got off the streets, when I was about 17 or 18, I had to turn to making things because I basically could never find a place to ever express what I had experienced. I remember one of the most emotional experiences was one day being picked up by this guy who was very creepy. And I remember lying on this dirty bed that was one of these cheap hotels. And this guy sucking my dick, his mouth was sticky and that he would kiss my leg and there would be like this gummy kind of stuff on my leg. And it was all the stuff that I was really repulsed by and not enough to not have a heart on. I remember feeling all this incredible emotion for this guy. I just felt so sad for him that at some point I like reached under his arms and pulled him up to me and kissed him on the mouth, which is the thing that I least wanted to do. He started weeping and just said, nobody's ever done that, and ended up giving me extra money and whatever, which I was quite happy with. And there was a lot of violence. I got robbed just about every day. You know, I always get shaken down by groups of kids or junkies. It's like a whole experience of living on the streets when I ran away from home, of feeling the world set up in such a way that it seems that I'm constantly working against it rather than alongside. Most guys that I meet, their lives are just so completely different. You know, there's, there's no real communication where I can feel totally free in expressing my, my ideas and my desires and my experiences. My experiences as a hustler seems to be one thing that sits on the back of my shoulder. One thing that's incredibly hard to convey to people is the level of promiscuity of that era. This is something that's really hard to describe people younger. We thought sex was good for you. That what was bad for you is not having sex. And what was bad for you was repression of sexuality. That was bad. This is before AIDS, or before we were aware of AIDS. I grew up in North Carolina, and when I first moved to the East Village, smoke, smoke, smoke. it was cliche things you see in the movies and drug dealing places. Dealers standing around selling coke and dope, coke and dope, C and D, C and D. People forget how much the rest of America hated New York. We were a bunch of junkies and cocksuckers as far as America was concerned, and, and it was a real sense of cultural decline. There had been this huge shift between the kind of idealisms of the 60s and the first civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. All these things had derailed by the mid-70s. And so we were responding to that in different ways. I walked up to the park and the streets were completely empty and traffic was non-existent. I opened up my pants and I walked up and down the, the pathways and there's just like this really quiet sort of loneliness there. I mean, I felt like I was like, you know, back where it started from. I mean, filled with this sense of, uh, of anxious, and the fact that I'm 26 and thinking about myself and my values, my actions, and thinking about the effect of people on people, wondering if any of it's meaningful, if it's futile. 
trying to figure out what it is that my life is and where I've been going. This is a man whose time has come. A man whose principles have been familiar to Americans for 30 years. A man whose accomplishments make him the natural choice for President of the United States. We will make America great again. Thank you very much. Reagan is the president of this country now. Going through a time in my life that seems desperate, surreal, awful, and slightly wondrous all simultaneously. Met a fellow a month or so ago, Peter Hujar, a photographer who, in some interesting ways, is like a mirror of scenes I'm entering. He has the same desperate and, at times, confused outlook but mine is the one seed of hope that I have in me. The relationship between Peter and David is one of the most interesting relationships between artists in a very long time. More interesting than Van Gogh and Gauguin. Very, very special and unique. When Peter started his career as a photographer in the 50s, it was not considered a real art form. His photographs were mostly portraits, mostly of people he knew, but he did know some rather famous people. You know, he's truly an artist, but Peter was very difficult, and in terms of having a career, he was not very good at it. These walls were very small. The New York art world fit in one restaurant. One restaurant, okay? I heard of Peter before I met him. The number of people who would have heard of Peter, you know, 12. He may have been a saint on Avenue A, but it was underground thing. He did not have that standing in the, quote, real art world. He was stranded. Nothing was going nowhere. Howdy do, howdy do. This is huge Arena again. I was wondering if David's steamed vegetable was there. This is Peter Fast Juice. Peter last night in the bar when I told him about doing a portfolio and throwing out all the drawings that I thought were aggressive or upsetting, told me not to throw out any drawings, no matter what my taste is and what my ideas are. If I feel it's good, there'll be somebody who will pick up on it. I shouldn't start compromising and trying to adapt to other people's taste. And last night I was standing around here at 5, 6 in the morning, looking through the portfolio, looking at my photographs. I was really startled. It was like the first time that I sat down and really looked at them in ages since I did them. And I realized that they are good. And that there's absolutely no reason for me to deny them or throw them away. They're my life, and I don't owe it to anybody to distort that just for their comfort. I think that everything David thought an artist could and should be was embodied by Peter. And Peter was the purest of the law. Tremendous respect for anyone else who had that same drive. Called them those people. And those people were special. He was a tough judge. And when he discovered David, he realized he's one of them. This guy is one of them. He's talented in a chaotic way. And Peter saw right away both the talent and the chaos. When Peter first met David and talked about him, I paid zero attention to Peter about this. Zero? I didn't pay that much attention to the people I was sleeping with. I don't know why I should pay attention to the people that Peter was sleeping with. I was under the impression that he was a teenager because he had that band called like Four Teens Killed Three or Three Teens Killed Four, which of course I never heard of. The story about three teens playing for the first time it has to do with dance interior being shut down for not having a liquor license. David and I were busboys at Dance Security. We worked together. 
it was an interesting crowd of people. Keith Haring was a busboy there too, and Madonna was hanging out. They advertised having a full bar until 8 in the morning. In the time, mind you. Totally a mob operation. This is a hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Bunch of us went to jail. David escaped, and then he had concocted a Molotov cocktail somehow to blow up the police vehicle. But he couldn't figure out how to do it without, you know, hurting people. We spent the night in jail, and then glamorized that event. You know, we put on a show. Now, I don't know why we thought we needed a benefit for funds, because the mob paid for the fucking lawyers who got our cases dismissed. Jerry, a little more volume on the drums. And anyway, we had a benefit, so we threw together a band, three teams go for. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Jesse and I and David wanted to continue it. I knew their drummer had fallen out. I went and bought a rhythm machine because I didn't know how to play anything. I thought, well, I can push buttons, so I did that. I don't think any of us were very proficient, but it wasn't really the point. It was an effort to not really necessarily make music, but to have a film almost for your ears. We ended up calling it the Cacophonic Barrage. As opposed to music. We were really ahead of our time with the use of samples, and that was David's instrument. David would come up to a mic with his handheld tape recorder and blast sounds. Yes, 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 yes. He calls the gun and the grenades a great equalizer. It used to be said that a revolver made all men six feet tall. I heard a rumor that Frank Zappa was in the audience one time when we played, and he said that we used the tapes like lead guitar, which I thought was a great comment. There was a time in America that if a quote-unquote glory hole appeared, the police would throw him in jail on morals charges. <laughs> Limp-wristed sissies. David wasn't really of the art world. At that point in time, he was just an individual that was doing his thing. He used to come over to my house to make art because there was more room in my house than in his house, which is funny because I had a tiny East Village apartment with the bathtub in the kitchen and the toilet in the hallway. We would get on the floor and make stencils and posters for the band. <laughs> We made 12 posters, put them up on the street. Most of them were ripped down immediately. So I started thinking about more permanent things, and I started going out on the street. I put up images around Astor Place along 8th Street. But I didn't have any intention of being a street artist. I was just being provocative. Ready on the firing line. I went downtown and hit every gallery door I could find with images of the burning house and the plane and the figure. It was an aggressive thing. And the idea of New York City streets filled with soldiers, that kind of tense atmosphere. I was just a rabid fan of David. He was pretty obscure at that time. But I knew about the piece him and Julie Hare did in the Leo Castelli building, the shrine to contemporary art at that time. Julie and I wanted to do a series of action installations, which were basically uninvited installations. We wanted to open up what culture was to us, as opposed to what was handled by rich white people. 
I don't really remember any planning stages of this, but we went to the west side where all the butchers were. The meatpacking district, which used to be a meatpacking district, um, you would never want to go there because the smell of blood from the actually butchering and packing meat. There were big cans outside of the butchers with giant cow bones in them. So we got a bunch of bones, we put them in this little wagon. We brought a couple of hundred pounds of bloody cow bones, dumped them into the staircase. Did a stencil painting with spray paint of an empty plate, a knife and a fork. And then the military bombers, houses in flames, and figures recoiling on the wall, and then left. They stenciled the despair of New York at that time, and then they pour gallons and gallons of cow's blood down the stairs. Nobody seemed to think anything was a myth. I imagine they thought it was just part of the art world. Six months later, I was still doing stuff in the street. That's when somebody approached me from one of the galleries and asked me if I wanted to put a painting on one of the shows. So I said, sure. David ends up in a show with people like Julian Schnabel and David Hockney, and lots of people who were famous. He was completely unknown. A lot of artists were doing graffiti in the East Village. Keith Haring and Basquiat, and David was doing it. There were no resources like now. You can go down to the Lower East Side, and there's like a dozen young galleries you've never heard of that are showing stuff. There was nothing. There was Soho and there was Uptown, and there were these established galleries. We didn't feel we had any entree into there, so we created space so we could show our work and have fun. Dean Savard and I started the gallery through a series of one-night parties. There was no real intention of making any money. We would put the art up for one night, we'd invite friends, we'd sit around on the floor, drinking beer, smoking pot, talking about art. When my gallery first started, I had gotten, I think, $200 back from my taxes, and I thought, oh, let's have a party. I had photographs in my bathroom, and my bathroom was a toilet and three walls because the bathtub was in the kitchen. That was the Lou Division, the Gracie Mansion Gallery Lou Division, L-O-O. -O. Never did I think that anybody would show up after the party. Eventually, we decided that, oh, we'll leave the art up for a little longer. We were really drawn to David's militaristic imagery. We decided that we would put him into a group show. We put this really large painting that David did. It was one of the most unusual things I had seen an artist do, expressing what was going on around us at the time, where mankind stood at that point, where self-annihilation could occur. We were actually trying to sell the work. I'm trying to remember how much we were asking for it. I think probably around $5,000. Of course, we didn't sell it because nobody was coming into the gallery with that kind of money back then. The interesting thing about the East Village, though, when there were artists that were really kind of special, everybody knew about it, or they'd be this buzz about it. So there was a little bit of buzz about David. He had that book, Sounds in the Distance, which came out, and I was so impressed because on the back it had Blur by William Burroughs, and I was like, oh my God, this artist must be really incredible because William Burroughs wrote something about it. When we did the famous show, which was in... 82. We were looking for portraits of famous people by famous and soon-to-be-famous artists. David brought in this painting Peter Hujar, dreaming about Yushio Mishima and St. Sebastian at the last minute after everything was already up on the wall. Typical. Typical. There was like no space because there were so many people and he had a really big piece, so where are you going to put a really big piece? You hang it from the ceiling. That's why I love this photograph of the opening where you can't really see any of the art, but you can see David's piece because it's on the ceiling. <laughs> Early images were all very simple images, but I just wanted to record things that I didn't see people recording and painting at that time. You know, I wanted to record my own history or a different history, and that's what a painting originally was for me. All the paintings are diaries that I always thought as proof of my own existence. Four. The 
president had indeed been shot. The president was shot once in the left chest. The bullet entered from the left side. He is in stable condition. Mrs. Reagan rushed to the hospital and the president jokingly told her, Honey, I forgot the duck. I think he misconstrued that one is celebrating Reagan's assassination attempt. But it's media critique. He was wheeled into surgery and equipped to his doctors. I hope you're all Republicans. We are not essential laborers. Laborers, laborers. Three Kings Kill 4 had a song called Hunger, which was about the underclass and disparity of wealth in this country. Last night, I ran into Brian and Jesse, discovered them to be in a big discussion about the politics of clubs and politics of bands. They just did not want to hear it. When you're trying to do a fucking job and support yourself and be able to do things that you feel are really important. There were lots of different reasons why he wanted to leave the band. He wanted to do painting. He wanted to have more control over what he was doing. I remember having an argument with David. He said to me, I can't really be friends with someone who doesn't like what I do artistically. I said, well, David, there's a lot of your art that I don't like. <laughs> and there's a lot of that anger that I don't relate to and don't necessarily want to collaborate with. Hi, this is Helen of Troy calling from Poughkeepsie. Oh, got you on that one. Ha ha. Goodbye. Hi, this is Hugh Jar. I was just checking to see whether you were in a place of painterliness. Bye. David came over to our place early one morning. He said, you guys got to come to this huge pier with all these walls, and there's nobody there. We had to slip under a chain link fence, got into the building, and it was really impressive, remarkable space for years been abandoned, like a couple football fields in size. The idea was for artists to make work there, surreptitiously. Yeah, it was very adventurous and illegal. And that was very much connected to David's knowledge of the piers as a place for sexual trysts and that whole subculture around it. And in a way, they kind of spoiled that spot. No one could go there for their acts anymore because there were too many people traipsing through. The ground floor was thousands of square feet with very high ceilings. And upstairs, there were rooms. David and I found piles of discarded files. Psychological evaluations from Bellevue. They had them draw pictures of men and women. And you know, most were very, very loose. You know, it's like how you drew in elementary school or something like that. And then others were sort of more, you would say, like, in quotes, sophisticated or this or that. But they were very emotional and had a great deal of resonance in them. Hi, David, this is Kiki. I think you've got my squeegee for silk screening, and I need it. OK, bye-bye. I was doing a lot of silk screening then, and I taught him how to make silk screens. So we decided to use these images and make a collaboration. The first time I met David, it wasn't physically. It was more uh, mind to mind, like a um, vibration. It was summer 83. I wasn't involved in the art scene. But one day, there's a French photographer who came to visit New York, and he said, did you hear about the abandoned pier where all these artists go and paint on the walls and do things? And I said, no. He took me there. I fell in love with that place, you know? It was like so deathly romantic. One day, 
Somebody told me the story of this artist, David Wonarowicz, who opened the place. And I remember right away I had a crush on this guy. I thought this guy must really be great, you know, to open a place like that, to call people to come and collaborate and paint. For me, he was already somebody special. In the end, you know, hundreds of artists were doing things there and French fashion magazines were doing shoots in there. It got so big, the police came. They closed it down. The whole magic was lost. They started tearing it down. And I have a picture of the gagging cow of David's while the pier is being pulled down. Then the pier disappeared into the river and was, was gone. Fit the East Village scene exploded at the same time. It wasn't until David had his first solo exhibition for us that everything broke loose. The first exhibition was very interesting in a sense that it was something nobody had really seen before, painting things that weren't really intended to be painted on. He'd stencil images over supermarket posters, trash can lids, driftwood. Everything was about something that was found and didn't cost anything, because again, nobody had any money. And it was that exhibition that Grace Gluck, the New York Times art critic, rode up on her bicycle and started looking at the artwork, asking us about the artist, and asked for a photograph of one of David's pieces. Grace Gluck showed up and was really a joke to us that she wanted to write something. And so for us, it was very tongue-in-cheek. You know, did these very serious interviews. And she went around to other galleries like Gracie's, and suddenly, boom. An article appeared in the Sunday lifestyle section of the New York Times. It talked about the galleries in the East Village, David's artwork. It was after that the collectors really started coming down. This limousine pulls up in front of our little gritty, drug-infested street. <laughs> Robert Pincus Witten, who's an art critic in New York, and a very elegant woman, comes into the gallery. They look at each piece, examining Robert's whispering in her ear. Soon after, he said, we'll take this one, this one, this one, and this one. We'll take that one over there. And it was like, oh my god. I practically ran over to the pyramid, and David and Dean were having a beer. I said, oh my god, we sold so much work. It was such a euphoric feeling. All of a sudden, the art rolls gave this East Village scene, it's 15 minutes fame. Our neighborhood now all of a sudden had 60 galleries in it and that people were coming by in limousines. Fuck you, faggot fucker. We were going around the gallery putting the names on these little stickers on the wall. And what's the name of this one? And David said, fuck you, faggot fucker. It was a piece of torn paper that David had found on the street that somebody had written this homophobic slur on. I said, David, that's so offensive. Do we have to call it that? And David was like, that's the name, it's gonna stick. Fuck you, faggot fucker. I walked in and the painting just riveted me. It's two boys kissing over a map. And then on the four corners, there's Brian Butterick posing as Saint Sebastian. And there was David posing in the Cristadora. I said, I'll give you $3,000. And he said, sure. Back then, 1984, that was a lot of money, but it's been a prized possession since then. Hi, David, it's Marissa. Prison rape is back. It just walked in the door from Montreal. So could you come pick it up as soon as possible? Thank you, bye-bye. I think a lot of the reason David is important now is because people recognize emergent queer sensibility in David. I'm not gay as in I love you, I'm queer as in fuck off. Everything I did with David was collaboration, but the concept of it has always been David. He proposed to make a poster about being queer in America. David knew a place under the Brooklyn Bridge. We went there with the track. I put some blood on David's face. We lit the scene with the lights of the track, and we took the photo. I went through the dark room and I started printing the photo. It scared me. 
It really scared me to see this image of David beat up coming under the chemicals. It looks so real. A number of months ago, I read in the newspaper that there was a Supreme Court ruling which states that homosexuals in America have no constitutional rights against the government's invasion of their privacy. The paper stated only people who are heterosexual or married or have families can expect these constitutional rights. And realizing I got nothing left to lose in my actions, I let my hands become weapons, my teeth become weapons, every bone and muscle and fiber and ounce of blood become weapons, and I feel prepared for the rest of my life. Hi, David, it's Gracie. Can you uh, give me a call at home about the Whitney? Eighty-five was a big year. David had two major pieces in the Whitney Biennial. I mean, that's an amazing. Everything happened really fast. Hi, I wanted to make sure somebody told you you made the front page of the Washington Post on Sunday for the Biennial. A big reproduction of your piece. Bye-bye. It was major for all of us to be accepted in the bigger art world. But David wasn't like, oh my god, I got into the Whitney Biennial. Not at all. No. No, I mean, he really thought about whether he wanted to do it. David has a certain kind of political consciousness that plays into his work, who owns it, where it's shown, the whole thing. He was not particularly thrilled about a bunch of rich, money, capitalist people in the Whitney thinking that he was great. There's no gratification for that in him. And those people are very classist and judgmental. He wanted to be recognized by people that would appreciate his work, but the right people for the right reasons. You know, Peter Hushar had a lot of the same attitude. The gallery system is one of the big obstacles <laughs> to art. Yeah, it's only been recently that there's art stars, there's people who make tremendous amounts of money overnight. Yeah. Art today, it is a commercial product. So the people are doing art that looks like art. I agree. Turning out a product. And I think that when an artist perceives what he does as a product, He's in trouble. That's it. I mean, it's like they turn into little mini factories. And there's yeah, I nothing don't... human about it. There's no odor. There's no stink. Hey, David, you know you're in New York Magazine. They did a review at the Biennial, and they reproduced your piece. But I also wanted to talk to you about the Mnuchin. OK, bye-bye. Adrian and Robert Mnuchin were two collectors. He was on Wall Street, and she had a cashmere store and her name was Adrian. Now it's like Adriana or something. But anyway, at that time she was Adrian. They commissioned David, and it was the most money that David had ever gotten for anything to do this big installation in their basement. He needed the money, so he was glad that I had made this sale, but a part of him really was very unhappy about it. David didn't really like rich people. <laughs> So he took all this garbage off of the street and put it into the installation. They were scouring all the vacant lots to grab the nastiest shit they could. <laughs> you know, it looked like the plague had descended upon their place. He basically filled it with trash and made a beautiful installation out of it. But so much of it just looked like tetanus. And it had bugs. Adrian was like, freaked out. These bugs were being brought into her pristine brownstone. Of course, David loved it. He brought in more. <laughs> David, hi, it's Gracie. I'm just checking in, seeing how everything's going with the installation, if you need any help. Um, and what's up? Basically, just a what's up call. Um, OK, I want to talk to you. OK, bye-bye. So when you look at the photographs Peter Hujar took of that installation, it was all garbage. It was great, like a lot of figures. There was the burning child, and there was the big mural in the background. There was a tree and a lot of cow skulls. It was an incredible installation. Well, in retrospect, that was Mnuchin, the a-hole dealer whose son, Steve Mnuchin, is, is part of Trump's cabinet. 
Fuck these assholes. I got really angry of that sudden attention money being thrown at me. I was yeah. starving three years yeah. earlier. And then it suddenly crossed a line where what I make is feeding me, is, is giving me all this stuff, but then I have all this hate about the structure of that because it's yeah. so full of shit. And this is something that rattled me. I realized that I came out of a totally violent, fucked up background growing up as a kid. Came to New York, went onto the streets, almost died on the streets. But once your economics are taken care of, once you don't no longer have to struggle to pay rent or eat any shit that's underneath close to the surface. Hi, Dave, it's Pat. I don't know if you're home, or maybe you're sleeping. Well, the first thing I want to say is that your paintings are fantastic. I am so impressed. I'm so proud of you. I tried to take pictures, but they wouldn't let me use the flash. And I... Patty was always close to David. Love you a lot. Bye. Even after we grew up, we were completely split up. So the first time I ever learned about his artwork, I picked up some magazines. And there was David in Life magazine. I was so much in awe with saying, wow, look where this guy is at, you know? I finally found a way to get in touch with him. It was an interesting thing to sit down with him. I came to New York and he started spewing off about he was a child prostitute, he's gay. And I got the feeling that he was testing me. I think he was afraid that I would never accept him being gay. I just was glad that he was okay. Dave, this is Steve Cohen. I don't know if you need maps for your artwork, but I just threw out about 5,000 of them today. I worked for AAA, so he had free maps. Whenever he needed them, I'd make sure he got them. Maybe I can save me some money. Okay, bye-bye. Hey, David, this is Richard. Yeah, I just wanted to get together with you and talk about making a movie or something like that. I'm up. Give me a buzz. Bye. It was one of those nights David and I wanted to get high. I said, hey, why don't we try shooting ecstasy? I've got some of that. David and I got into this deep, deep conversation. I said, let's make a movie where we try to figure out why young people are the way they are, the punks and all that stuff, and just shot a quick movie. I think we did it in a day. David played the father, Karen Finley played the mother. It ended up being a lot of things from David's childhood. He definitely had the most fucked up stories. Stop playing with your food. Do you call this food? Look, it isn't even fucking cooked. It's all bloody. Shut up! David said that when he was a kid, they had a rabbit. My father got us rabbits, and he said he gave away the rabbits. And then Patty found out somehow that he had him butchered him. We winded up beating our pet rabbit, which I think was horrific. And that really bothered David, too. You know what this is? No. See that? That's my bunny. What are you doing to it? And you know what this is? David finally was starting to deal with what had happened to him during his childhood. He started using heroin. It was almost a social drug in the East Village. I had some junk that I had laying around, so I did it in the bathroom. The light and everything just started making me feel sick. David took drugs in a way that Peter was sure would destroy him. And Peter knew too much about the way artists can sabotage themselves to let that go one step further. At some point, Peter said, David, what are those marks on your arm? He said, oh, it's nothing. He said, don't tell me it's nothing. And you are going to stop taking heroin today, right now. You will never take it again as long as you live. And if you do, I will never speak to you again. You will be dead to me. David started crying, and he stopped heroin. He never took it again because Peter was the most important relationship in his life. They first had an affair, but I don't think that lasted that long. And then they were friends, but at a certain point, I really thought of David as Peter's son. 
Peter didn't think of him as Peterson, and probably David didn't, but to me, that's what it seemed like. Well, what else can we talk about? What was the great love of your life? What was? Yeah, Who was? <laughs> I mean, the great love of my life is my work. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the great love of your life? I don't think I've ever had one. I don't know. I met David at the Bijou Theater, which was a gay porn theater. Our eyes met and we went to the bathroom and had a little bit of sex and I said, why don't you come over to my apartment? Which I rarely did with people that I met there. But I was just fascinated with this guy. And we left and I asked David what he did and he said he was a painter and I said, what, of houses? And he said, no, 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 I paint things. And apparently he was quite well known in the East Village and I didn't know who he was, I had no idea. So he came over and we had a really sweet night. He left me a little painting that he did for me that I really loved and we started seeing each other. I felt my world was very different after I met David. I was totally swept up with him. So here I am heading out into the cold winds of the canyon streets, walking down and across Avenue C towards my home, with the smell and the taste of them wrapped around my neck and jaw like some scarf. And how it follows me in and out of restaurants and past cops and early morning children and past bakery windows filled with brides and grooms on rows and rows and rows of endless wedding cakes. Hey, Juicy Lips, are you there? It's about 12, 20. David kept talking about this best friend of his that he had in the East Village, and we had to go see him, and his name was Peter, and Peter, and all of a sudden I said, are you talking about Peter Hujar? And he said, well, how did you know that? ho dee do ho dee do I said, well, I had a little affair in the 70s with Peter for a month, and I kept thinking, oh, great, Peter's going to tell him I'm an asshole. But Peter thought, actually, that I was good for David, you know, that I could help David. I could be a settling kind of thing for him, which actually probably is true. But they were so close that it was, I couldn't even describe what that was. Much different than our relationship. And I'm just trying to figure out where I fit in his life. He said, I have three priorities in this order. Peter, my art, and you. But I had to find that to be okay. It was hard at first, but as I looked at it, I realized there was no threat there. This was a whole other thing. Hi, David, this is Carla, wishing you a happy new year. Hi, David, this is Brigitte. I wanted to wish you a happy new year. Howdy do, howdy do. It's the Nuffer, and the monks last night were great. You would have actually loved them, I think. There were 10 of them, and they sang in voices that was like, no deeper than that. No, I can't do it. It was really nice. They did a healing ceremony. Well, anyway, that's all I have to say. Goodbye. I took Peter to the doctor. I don't remember what was wrong with Peter, how Peter felt that made him have the test. They didn't tell you there. It took two weeks for this test to come back. And I remember very much that Peter called me. And I can't describe to you. I said, w w how are you? And he goes, Fred. And then he made this sound like, um, like a, not a scream, a kind of a scream. More it sounds to me like an animal sound, not like a human, to say his test came back positive. When Peter was diagnosed with AIDS, I came over 10 minutes later. He went to meet me at the door, and there was some mail that arrived, and it fell on the floor. And I remember him picking it up and turning and just saying, even something like getting a piece of mail has an entirely different meaning. And from that, I constructed something of what this man is facing. I felt very sad. I felt angry. I felt fear. I felt the possibility of my own diagnosis. David was sitting at the table and he was crying and I didn't know what was going on and he told me that Peter had been diagnosed with AIDS. He was destroyed. I mean, it was so emotional for him. It was so upsetting. 
when Peter was diagnosed, David asked me if I could help him because Peter really had no income. He had no money, he had no reason, he had nothing and he didn't want to lose his apartment. I worked as director of New York City's AIDS program, and it was through Tom that I met David. This was an epidemic of great proportions, and the city ignored it for quite a while. In fact, everyone ignored it. People with AIDS who were getting sick and losing their jobs were coming to apply for public assistance. Because AIDS had a stigma already, none of the traditional systems in place wanted anything to do with them. The staff wouldn't touch their paperwork. They often died before they got any benefits at all. Mayor Koch finally decided that something needed to be done. He started a very little program and I have to say, we probably broke every rule in the book in order to get people what they needed. So I went over like a good caseworker, and I fell in love with him. I mean, he was an amazing person. I could certainly ease a lot of his fears. He couldn't believe that he wouldn't lose his apartment and he'd have some kind of income. Hippity hoppity, happy Easter eggs. This is Peter Cottontail. This is the ex-Peter Cottontail. Are you there? Hello, Odie Do. Peter was prone to Great Depression. I mean, he never took a photo after his diagnosis. He gave that up entirely. A couple of times I did confront him because I thought he was stuck. And that was the only time I allowed myself to confront him when I thought that he was just shutting down and so full of rage and not strong enough to express it. I remember him threatening to throw himself in front of a car because he was mad. And he didn't have the strength to walk to the curb and throw himself in front of the car. He talked about killing himself endlessly, brutally. I want to go to that building across the street and jump off the roof. And he would say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And he would say it every day until one day we gave him a number of a doctor who would give medicine to kill himself. And once I gave him the number, he tucked it away and never spoke about killing himself again. David had like a huge career. Then when I did the Four Elements, we didn't sell a thing. It was over. Art world is very fickle like that. Once you start getting a certain amount of something, you have to keep it going or it fizzles out. I had this naive sense that once people supported work, then that doesn't just disappear, that, you know, that they'll watch what you do and they'll take interest and they'll follow it, which isn't the case at all. It was the end of the East Village scene, and so-called East Village art had just gone out of style. Hi, this is Hugh Jar. I'm on my way to the horse pistol to stay there for a while. I guess you can find my number by calling Gabrini Hospital. Goodbye. He lost weight. He had the beginnings of dementia. He just was kind of fading away. I'm sitting in his hospital room so high up in the upper reaches of the building and leaning against the glass of the window of his room, I can see dizzily down into the street. It's a gradual turn of the earth outside the windows. I wonder what it is to fall such distances. I'm afraid he's really dying. And he barely opens his eyes for more than a few seconds. And his breath was coming in rapid fire bursts like a machine gun. I turn from the silence in the window and look at him, and an iris appears beneath one half lifted eyelid, and its strength pours right through me. 
and I turn away almost embarrassed having as much life in me as he has. <laughs> It was Thanksgiving, and I met David in Peter's room at the hospital. Ethel Eichelberger was there, and Peter was in a coma. I mean, he really wasn't responsive in any kind of way. We're all sitting there, and Ethel says very quietly, he's not breathing anymore. His chest isn't going up and down. We called the nurse in. And the nurse said, yes, he had passed. And then David says, could you all leave me alone with him? If I could attach our blood vessels so that we would become each other, I would. If I could attach our blood vessels in order to anchor you to the earth, to this present time, to me, I would. It makes me weep to feel the history of you, of your flesh beneath my hands, in a time of so much loss. It makes me weep. All these moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Smell the flowers while you can. When Peter died, I went out to dinner with Anita and this nurse. He was talking about sometimes you could tell somebody was infected because they get a string of pearls along your neck, which was glands that would swell up. So while I'm sitting there, I run the fingers down my neck, and sure enough, I have a string of pearls, swollen glands. I decided to get tested. Came back positive. I had pretty good T-cell at that point. I wasn't sick or anything. David, he was very sympathetic and very supportive. But then at some point I said, you know, you're being very supportive, but you don't know your status. The first time I saw David, David had markers of infection, oral candidiasis, thrush. He didn't have a competent immune system. I don't think this came as a shock to David. but his T cells were really ravaged. David asked Dr. Friedman, do I have so few that I can name them? Back then, the magic number was 200 T cells. If you could keep the patient at 200 T cells or higher, there'd be less opportunistic infections. He had less than 100 when he was tested, so he was already in bad shape. Peter, hi, it's, or Peter, oh my God, I'm looking at the name, what a... Unbelievable psychological slur. This is Gracie calling for David. He came into the gallery and told us. He was very quiet about it. I mean, he came in and he said that he'd just been tested and he found out that he had it. It was devastating for me. I mean, I felt very protective of David. When Keith Herring came out about having AIDS, it just seemed like Everybody had to run, buy something of his, because he was going to die of AIDS. He had AIDS, and he was going to die. It was so gross how Keith was treated and how everything around him, what that was all about. And I didn't want that for David. I mean, I knew how private David was. And so when he told me, my first reaction was that we shouldn't tell anyone, which, of course, is the wrong response to have with David. That's when I picked up the phone and called Barry Blinderman and said, you have to do this retrospective now. Like, now. She was right in that this is what I do. 
books and retrospectives, and I was an avid fan of his work. I bought the painting, Fuck You, Faggot Fucker, back in 1984. There was an urgency to do the show while he was alive. I wrote a grant to the NEA, got the grant for $15,000, and started working with David, planning the exhibition and the catalog. I thought the phrase Tongues of Flame was very appropriate. It's a biblical reference, it's a reference to a play, it's a reference to a silent movie, but mostly Tongues of Flame. I'm thinking what a, an amazing orator he was. I was thinking about the burning child, I was thinking about the burning house, the incendiary aspect of it, the passion, and it just seemed like everything that was connected with David was on fire. One of the things that happened after my diagnosis is this thing of this may be the last work I do. So it's like trying to focus everything and channel it into this square or into this photograph or into this thing that it's all got to go in. All the anger, all the emotions, all the thoughts. I'm um, working on a series of sex images that take environments like the sky, the ocean, an airplane, train movements, a forest and a superimpose a circle that has a very explicit sex act and most of them are homosexual acts. Outside of the sex series, I'll place these circular images inside the field of painting. And so for me, the circles are like cells and they contain information and I see them as microscopic views, so it's like looking into the interior of something, like looking at a spot of blood and seeing the cells. I also see them as telescopic views, so that you could be looking through a telescope, and then that says something to me about surveillance, seeing something from a distance. I like the suggestions of all those things. It's about discovery. And I use dreams in my work. Dreams are very important to me. I usually write them down all the time. The dreams are an example of how the imagination can break all boundaries. His iconography is based off this profound sense he had that he could try to look at the universe. Everything organic and everything man-made all the delights and all the horrors and trying to put them together. But every aspect of it would be deeply personal. When Peter died, David took photographs of the head, the hands, and the feet. There's a tradition of taking death mask of someone important. Hands are important because they're how you physically interact with the world. And then the feet, I think are very important. And that goes back to the Old Testament and the New Testament. How do you greet people? You wash their hands, but it's more important you wash their feet because that's what's anchoring you to the world. And you find that all the way through classic spiritual literature. That iconic laying out of those images, incorporating them into Peter who's our dead with that text is really a call to arms. I was diagnosed with ARC recently, and this was after the last few years of losing count of the friends and neighbors who've been dying slow, vicious, unnecessary deaths because fags and dykes and junkies are expendable in this country. And at the moment, at the moment, I'm a 37 foot tall, 1,172 pound man inside this six foot body, and all I can feel is the pressure. All I can feel is the pressure and the need for release. David, it's bad. It's been too long, and I want you to know that I think of you, and I love you a lot, and I hope all is well. Last night I talked to my sister for the first time in seven months, I think. I told her about my diagnosis, and that was rough for me anyway. I thought she handled it pretty well, but then who knows? I remember Pat once saying to me, she'll never get AIDS or something like that, because I'm not one of those people I would around to have sex with everybody. I remember I didn't correct her. <laughs> I mean, how do you begin? Fabian 
After he had AIDS, we were fine, but it, there came that day when I called him on the phone and I told him our Aunt Helen was coming to visit. Boy, that set him off. Look, if it comes up, whether about my girlfriend or do you have girlfriends, I'm going to tell him I'm homosexual. And if it comes up, I'll tell him that I have this virus. If it goes far enough, I'll fucking confront him and ask him why the fuck they let this psychotic do this damage to us all these fucking years and, and not do a fucking thing about it and like talk about their God and all this other shit when they watch this guy, what he did to us. I'm tired of living these lies with these people and I'm tired of hiding from these people because I'm afraid of who I am or because I have problems with who I am and I'm not gonna go through it anymore. This is not the place. I said, if you wanna confront Aunt Helen, then go to Detroit and confront her. But you're not coming here. He went into a rage that frightened me. Don't insult me by inviting me to come after the relatives leave. That's right. Out of sight, okay? Get the fuck out of our sight until it's comfortable, until we can deal with you sitting here with your homosexuality, with your AIDS. Yeah, right, sorry for myself. I'm the one who's fucking dying, asshole. I'm the one who's gotta fucking confront things before I go, and that's what I wanna do. I wanna clear the fear out of my head. It was so painful to me, the way that he and I interacted. If I could do it all over again, I, I try to do it a little differently. So are, are you afraid to tell your children I have AIDS? And then he started saying, oh, your kids know that you have a faggot for a brother? That's not what I said. I said, are you afraid to tell your kids I have AIDS? And I said, David, they're young. One's three years old, the other one's six. It's too messy for me to be in your fucking life, so save it. Save it, Stephen. I don't need this from you. I don't need this kind of insult. I fucking face this every day, and I don't need it from quote unquote family. You understand? Well, this is a conversation ends, Steve. We never see each other again. Goodbye. And then I never saw him again. I've been feeling pretty crazy recently. A lot of anxiety. At some point, I realized I was just afraid of dying. Throughout all my life, I've tried to maintain some kind of complete control of myself from where I've come from. All the scenes as a kid hustling and all the scenes in the streets and the times I came close to death and the times when I nearly starved. Maybe need for self-control is to mask this enormous rage that I carry or may carry from all those experiences. I guess I fear and loss of control that that rage will spill and become indiscriminate in terms of what it attacks. But really and truly, I think I'm afraid of losing my mind at some point to some degenerative disease like meningitis or seizures or whatever. Don't want to lose touch with words. I want to be able to provoke some change in whatever limited fashion in people in a person. And I always had this fantasy that if I were to ever become ill and if I were to become so weak that I couldn't leave the house, which is another fear for me, I want to at least be able to tap that if I can keyboard, even if it's with a pencil held between my teeth, touching each key letter for letter. Despite rage, despite illness, despite pain, I hope that my mind continues. AIDS was revealing exactly what society was about, but was already there in his work. He knew already what the world was about. He knew the structure that sustained power. He knew the manipulation of people who would like to live differently. So the illness became a weapon against the politics of this society. When I was diagnosed with this virus, it didn't take me long to realize I'd contracted a diseased society as well. Thousands of demonstrators demand that New York City do more to help those suffering from AIDS. Healthcare is a right. Healthcare is a right. The scene evoked civil memories of the 60s. War. Civil rights or civil war. David and I went to ACT UP meetings. We marched with ACT UP. The city is dying. On some level, the most interesting thing that they have is information of what was happening in the hospitals. They were strapping minority babies to beds and giving half of them placebos. 
basically they're stealing these babies from their parents, saying this is the only way your baby can get treatment, sign this form, killing half of them purposefully with placebos. That alone, I thought was so outrageous. And all these information packages were given to the media. I thought, well, Jesus, this will change everything. I mean, how naive I was. We went down to Washington when ACT UP demonstrated at the FDA. Hundreds of angry demonstrators effectively shut down the FDA today. First in flames. Demonstrators say the AIDS crisis and the anger over it continue to grow every day. Charging that the government response to the AIDS disease is woefully inadequate, they say the demonstrations will continue. Our group made these tombstones and then laid down like we were dying. And so they arrested us. But it got headlines. Photographs of the tombstones came up many times. Civil rights or civil war. David got arrested a couple more times. For my own taste, I wish they would get a little bit more violent, express it a little stronger. That's one of the few things that people will respond to. And I'm waking up more and more from daydreams of tipping Amazonian blow darts and infected blood and spitting them out the exposed necklines of certain politicians. I'm not going to be polite and fuck these people that want me to be courageous. You know, I resent that, oh, how great he was, how courageous he was, all the way up to the end. There's no expression in that other than silence. Somebody once said to me that if you spit a piece of gum on the sidewalk, it's nothing. But if 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people spit their gum onto the same sidewalk, people have to deal with it. They become stuck in it when they walk through it. And I see that as part of a relationship with art. When people put themselves on the line in their work, whether it's music, writing, photography, painting, or whatever, in terms of culture with a capital C, they apply a tiny amount of pressure against the system of control that would willingly jump into fascism if there wasn't enough pressure on its throat. We are born into a pre-invented existence within a tribal nation of zombies. The government has a day-to-day -day job maintaining an illusion of a one-tribe nation. And inside of that one-tribe nation, there's actually millions of tribes. Historically, minorities have always been expendable in this country. Historically, art was made by certain classes of people for certain classes of people. What I make in my work is a record of things that challenges the record that we're given daily, whether through the newspapers, through the television, or through the politicians. I chose you to stay and fine. I chose you to stay and fine. If I were a violent person, I would go into the nation's capital and start annihilating the people that I believe responsible for this pre-invented existence are long dead. The way things are set in motion in terms of society, it's like a machine that runs itself that can't stop. It can run by itself, think by itself, police enforce it, schools enforce it, government officials enforce it, even the stupidity of large populations enforce it. Raise all the glory while we do it to them again. Yeah. Cardinal O'Connor has helped tens of thousands of people to their unnecessary deaths through the denial of pertinent safe sex information. He obviously prefers coffins to condoms. I know why we're here today. This is Jesus Christ. I'm in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral on Sunday. 
We're here reporting on a major AIDS activist and abortion rights activist demonstration. Inside, Cardinal O'Connor is busy spreading his lies and rumors about the position of lesbians and gays. They act as if because there's this abstract idea of what religion is, of what God is, that this man is untouchable, and he's not. And this church can be shut down the same way he shuts down abortion clinics, the same way he prevents people getting information or making personal decisions about their life, he can be shut down. Is the green light on? No, the green light's not on, but... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, the green light's on. Yeah, so it's on. It's rolling? Yeah. East Germany today took down the Berlin Wall. Back at that time, David had a big body of work, and it was really strong stuff, but his career kind of flattened out. The publicity from his contribution to the catalog for Witnesses Against Our Vanishing at Artist Space was what brought him to the national stage. And it wasn't for an artwork, it was for an essay. But he wrote in the catalog. I, I wouldn't say derogatory. You know, I don't think I'm, I'm being that critical. I asked David to write for the catalog. There aren't such intense people in the world anymore. He was a genius, which I don't use for anyone else I can think of. David's essay was talking about how the imagination was the last frontier for creative freedom. That in his imagination, he can douse Jesse Helms with gasoline and set his putrid ass on fire, I quote, or throw William Dannemeyer off the Empire State Building and made a reference to Cardinal O'Connor, total enemy of the state, called him that fat cannibal in skirts in the house of walking swastikas. Now, this didn't play well with <laughs> the establishment. Tonight, a Manhattan art exhibit about AIDS is losing a lot of federal money because of what will be shown in the exhibit. The chairman of the NEA states, we find that a large portion of the content is political rather than artistic in nature. Is the fact that I may be dying of AIDS in 1989, is that not political? Is the fact that I don't have health insurance and I don't have access to adequate health care, is that not political? And I, you know, I think that says it clearly. This is Washington, and Helms was on a rampage. He'd already racked up Maplethorpe, gotten the Corcoran to cancel their show. He'd already racked up Piss Christ. I mean, this was the time. And they were looking for the trifecta, the third thing, and David Vornarovich was perfect for this. This senator is unwilling to spend one penny. I'm saddened to see that um, Congress might not feel that this show should be a supported by the American taxpayer. Is this about homophobia, or what is it about? I, I'm confused by it. What are you thinking about? I, no, I just said, uh, you know, what happened, talking to this journalist from the Times, you know, he said that the NEA is claiming that what I said was horrible, monstrous, you know, inflammatory, this, that, it, the most terrible things that they can't even repeat for. And I said, look, a study done on violence in America found that there was increasing numbers of homosexual teenagers that were murdered or beaten up and that Dannemeyer tried to suppress that part of the study because it contained the word homosexual. Therefore, William Dannemeyer condones the murder and terrorizing of homosexual teenagers, and no gesture I can make could even approximate the violence of what these people have done. I'm not gonna sit still and be silent about it. How heroic. To the barricades! What's happening now? The Susan called up, and it turns out that uh, the NEA approached Susan, and now they're doing a joint press conference, issuing statements, and Susan does this paltry liberal motherfucking stance of, you know, I think there are certain issues that are not resolved here. And I said, what the fuck are you doing? I said, these assholes have themselves against the wall over all these issues, over homophobia, legislated silence of homosexuals and lesbians in this country. What you're doing is you're avoiding the whole fucking thing for your funding. And I said, you're a collaborator. You and your board, and it's indicative of the whole fucking art world. David was more skeptical and more negative about the art world than he was about Jesse Helms because he thought that curators of the art world hid art with queer ideas. 
and just anything that was out of the white one tribe nation, as he said, was being censored by the museums. You didn't need Jesse Helms and people like that because the museums were already doing the job for you. Okay, thanks. statement that this is the failure of the government to confront homophobia in this society. It's the legislation into silence of homosexuals and it's the failure to provide safe sex information to people with AIDS so that, uh, so that they can make informed decisions. Did she say that to the press? This is her statement she's, and that she's going to thank me uh, from the bottom of her heart uh, for what she's learned. I feel, you know, I feel pretty emotional about it. Oh, man. like this so badly. When I first went out there, I, I knew that it was like a fairly conservative town. I mean, I, I had fantasies of people with pitchforks storming the gallery. In the days that followed, people would come running over to talk to me when they spotted me. It was an extremely emotional, positive response. I should probably tell you how the controversy happened about a month into the show. There was one page in the book, it was a black and white homage to Jean Genet, who was one of David's heroes. I didn't know it was in color. He just gave us the black and white and we put it in the book. Jean Genet has a plate over his head that looks like a halo. There's angels, Tommy guns. And in the right hand corner, there's a picture of Jesus Christ with a hypodermic in his arm didn't make no never mind to me, but one of the people that got a hold of the book was Dana Rohrbacher, the right-wing politician from Orange County, California. Rohrbacher put together a screed with a Xerox image of Christ with the injectable, talking about, do you know what your NEA money's going for? 15,000 went to a show that has anal and oral homosexual sex. It's like a circus. This exhibition, Tongues of Flame, is an orgy of degenerate depravity. Letters and threats 
from people to the university saying, we hear you have this exhibition that is morally unacceptable. People would come to the show, and I'd end up having contests with them about who could quote the Bible better, me or them. Trying to explain to them that Jesus was the man of sorrows, and he was here to cleanse us of our sins, and if that meant taking on the pain of a junkie, then that's what Christ would have to do. Then, all of a sudden, I get a copy of a two-page pamphlet that has excerpts of David's greatest hits from Donald Wildman and the American Family Association. Donald Wildman got Pepsi to stop using Madonna as a spokesperson because of cones that she was wearing and she was being anti-religious. And evidently that had been sent to thousands of churchgoers and any senator or congressman who hadn't gotten it from Rohrabacher. I sent that to David and I said, look at this. And that's when the shit hit the fan. Coming up, Wunerovich explains why he's suing a group that's trying to cut off government funding of the arts. Donald Wildman went through a catalog, went through it with a pair of scissors. He searched out what he perceived to be tiny details of paintings or photographs that involved the portrayal of sexual activity, sometimes using less than 2% of a single painting. He represented these mutilated fragments as my work. This week, Wojnarowicz took Wildman to court for violating his copyright and distorting his work by taking it out of context. What I remember was the whole courtroom completely full of artists and friends of David and Reverend Wildman sitting there like he was in hell, like in his mind, in the most awful place that the Lord could have possibly put him. There was full of sinners and sodomites and blasphemers all around him. And people dressed in black. And everyone's dressed in black, and he looked tortured. This is something that I argued with David about numerous times. And David was sick. I said to him, you, know, you don't have this time to waste. You're not going to change their minds. They don't have minds. The so-called ideas of these people like Waldman, they're not ideas. They're aspects of bigotry. There are always people like this. Sometimes they're more powerful than others. That was a moment of power for those kind of churches and those kind of people. We're in one now, again. But in between, they lost power. And in the end, they never have the power of an artist. David Wojnarowicz is more valuable than every one of these preachers that ever lived as a person and as what he put into the world. David was being cast as that angry young man who was just screaming all the time. And people had told him that he was not a good painter. So he was challenging himself to make beautiful paintings of flowers. But within that, of course, he put his writing. And he did it in a way that melded with the pictures. But as you read the works, you realize he was telling stories of death and politics. I mean, it's just really sad, beautiful show. I wonder what this little bug does in the world, what his job is. And if this little bug dies, if the world feels it, I mean, does the earth feel it? Does the world get a little lighter in the rotation? There's another one. Mm -hmm. So you think they're married? Or are they homosexuals on vacation? <laughs> David was HIV positive in 88. I went to New York a lot, a lot of time to work with him until 1991. I mean, for me, he wasn't sick. You couldn't see on his face, on his body, he was sick. Until the last trip we did, there's one moment where I felt this virus took his mind. In May 1991, 
we did this trip in the southwest. We were in Death Valley driving, and I said to David, let's stop here, I would like to take photos. David said, look, I'm not really feeling good. I stay in the car, go, and I just want to stay here. I don't know, maybe I left a half hour. Then I came back to the car, and David was laying down with the seat down. He was like white, completely white. I said, David, and he didn't answer to me. He wasn't sleeping. His eyes were open, and then he looked at me, and he wasn't there. He was somewhere, I don't know where. I started getting scared. I touched his face saying, David, 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 David. And he came back slowly to consciousness. And then he started laughing like nothing happened, like he was nowhere, that like it has been here. That's the moment I felt that uh, something was shifting in his mind. Actually, I, I, I'm blank. I, you know, my memory seems to come and go. I, I forget so many things uh, these days where it just seems huge blocks of time are suddenly gone and then David. they come back. The same trip, David took his camera and he said, I would like you to take a photo of me like if I was buried. So we silently start digging and I cover him with sand and earth. I took different photos. I took photos from behind. It was very strong, very strong. And that was the last trip we did together. We never met again. We spoke over the phone, but we never met again. I guess it was about September of 91. He called me in the middle of the night, probably around two in the morning. He said that he had a fever and he was shaking, and so I came over. I put him under a quilt and he was just really shivering like he couldn't stop. And that was the beginning of it. That was the start of it. From then on, things started to slowly but surely go downhill. He was hospitalized for eight to 10 days. They did tests, but then he went home. And literally from then on, he was never really much out of bed. Hi, David, Penny Arcade. I have a friend who's on the board of directors for the Museum of Modern Art. He's interested in getting Peter into the museum. Call me so I can talk to you, okay? Bye. When you two did a concert out at the Meadowlands in New Jersey, they sent a limousine for us. And before the concert, we met with them. Bono wanted to know if we wanted to pray with them. We said, no, nah, I think we'll pass on that, thank you. you know? <laughs> but it was just so special. I mean, he was thrilled. He was really, truly thrilled. Hi, David, it's Kiki. Siobhan said that you went back in the hospital, so I hope you're okay. He was in and out of Cabrini a number of times, and after one of them, he said, I'm never going back again. Home care was established in that loft of, of the movie theater for him. That became a hospital room, and most patients didn't have that at that time. David was one of the first people to have that level of home care. And probably that was the force of his personality and Tom's organizational skills. If not for Tom, that wouldn't have happened. David? David? Hello? It's Pat. I just want to let you know, I talked to Tom, and I told him when I'm coming in, I'm worried about you. I hope... 
I just hope that you have someone around you, and, uh, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Big kiss. Bye-bye. His decline was speeding up. Dementia was setting in. It was in and out. It was getting more and more difficult, and he was more and more tired. Things were happening for David, and you could tell David that Mama had just bought fire, and he would just go like, that's wonderful. And you could tell him five minutes later, and he would not remember. It was like Groundhog Day. You could just absolutely tell him the same thing over, and he had absolute happiness. It was a very beautiful, wide-eyed David. It wasn't like it wasn't him, but he was joyous. Dr. Bob said, real person comes out when they get into dementia. If they're nasty at core, they'll be nasty. But David was as sweet as he could be. It was heartbreaking for me. He didn't think anybody would stick around if he got sick or he was dying. He was very much afraid of that. And I think as a result of how badly he was treated as a kid. You know, there was a tremendous sadness and fear for me worrying about him and knowing he was just getting worse and worse. But at the same time, I felt grateful that I could be there for him. Looking out the windows, I can place myself somewhere out in that sky, lie down in that texture and dream of years and years of sleep. And I, and I talk. And I talk inside my head of change, no peace for this body beside me. Smell the flowers while you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. July 22nd, 1992. He died at the apartment, and there were like 12 of us there, all of his friends, his sister. The nurse said to Tom, I think he's gone. And um, that was it. It's no one thing that took David's life. It was the burden of carrying all those illnesses and that one body that was just too much for one body to bear. There were a lot of tears during that time. There were a lot of tears then. But I've gained a great deal of distance now, of course. And you know, in some ways, it's even hard to remember him, which I don't like. It's what time does to you. But he's always here, you know, he's always here. No matter what, I know he's here. I wasn't going to cry, and I'm already tearing up. <laughs> it's been so long coming. Oh. Here it is. It's a little overwhelming, isn't it? Wow. Look at all this. All the Peter Hujar dreaming. Yeah. Peter was quite an extraordinary character, and they were so connected. Yeah. Anita, there's your monkey. There's your monkey, sweetie. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> David painted it for Peter, and it was over his bed while he was sick. Yes. And when he died, they, they gave it to Anita. Kept David. it for 20 years. Yeah. And I'm so sorry I needed to sell it. <laughs> if I could buy it back from that woman, I would. Peter would always say that the monkey was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, the way David did it. This has always yeah. been a favorite. When I first saw it, it really kind of moved me a lot. At that point, David was not feeling very well, and I just kept thinking of extinction and Wojnarowicz. He's so clever, he really was. He had such a great childish imagination. Reflect. Right. 
resistance, then helping a system of control become more perfect. We rise to greet the state, to confront the state. So today in studio, we have Chris McKim, the director of Wojnarowicz, Fuck You, Faggot Fucker. Thanks for uh, making the trek to Brooklyn, Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. What was the inspiration behind this film? It all started July 2017. And at that point, we were like six months into Trump's administration. And I was losing my mind, as everyone else was. Um, and I was trying to figure out what my next project was. And I was sort of trying to find sort of archival type projects. The AIDS sort of crisis was, was also sort of one of the... the areas that I was sort of researching and trying to find somebody that might lend itself, something that might lend itself to a documentary. And that's when I stumbled across David. Now, I was aware of David. I knew some of his work, but I didn't know a lot about him. And I very quickly went down this wormhole one, you know, Friday afternoon, and I realized that there was all this story behind him and all this amazing work and all this writing. Um, and also, there, it was about a year before the Whitney retrospective, so I also saw that was coming up. And there had never been a documentary about him at that point. Uh, so I reached out to, to his estate through PBOW, the gallery that uh, managed him when, when he was still alive. Um, and things just rolled from there. It's just daunting to me, the idea of making a film based on like, like this. You know, we, we make documentary films here, but not based on this like trove of archive. You make it look effortless in a way when it's done. Thank but you. it had to have been a very challenging process, I imagine. Yes. Did you ever get lost in the, the weeds? Like, what am I, um, what story am I telling here? No, uh, not, not, the story part was, was not, um, was not the difficult part. I mean, you know, no, no more difficult than it always is. But we really, starting with the audio, it, I, I would cut little pods, um, and you can kind of feel it in the film. It is that kind of roller coaster of, of sections, throwing on some images, just ideas of stuff. And there's almost no sync video in the film. You know, there, there's the scene in David's apartment in the beginning and end, and then some of his band footage. But otherwise, it was just all piecemeal. And the really, the difficult part, handing over these chunks and, and sort of reviewing stuff with Dave, the editor, you know, there's, it's one thing to show somebody a string out of material with talking head interviews and some other footage, because you can, you can, you're watching the same reactions. You're seeing the, 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 in addition to hearing personalities come out through the interviews, you're really seeing it. So you, you don't really think about how much you're taking from the audio. But when you're watching something that might not even have any images on it yet, I re you know, you kind of realize that you're not necessarily seeing the same things because it's all, you know, up to the mind's eye. Um, and so that became a very, so the first few weeks were really hairy for me because I knew what I wanted the film to be, but I didn't know, I didn't, didn't know. You know, I think what we ended up doing was a great representation of what I was hoping for, but that would be hard to describe or know that, that we could actually do it. Um, and in the first few weeks, I just, I, I, I didn't know if it was going to happen <laughs> as we were started editing and I really panicked. I would imagine that you needed a real partner in making this film and you're, in, in so far as you're extremely talented editor. Yes, of course. Who understood yeah. the vision and how to do it. Yeah, and, and you know, post has always been the biggest part of it for me, even on those, the other projects, which rely so much on production. Production to me was always about like getting things to bring back to what I call like the sandbox of, of the editing bay um, to play with and, you know, there's all sorts of responsibilities and being true to the subjects and you know not doing no harm and all that stuff but it, it and, and telling a story that people relate to but at the end of the day it's always to me about like finding things that that speak you know speak to me or speak to us and that's kind of how it all you know i wake up every morning this kill a machine call america and i'm carrying this rage like a blood filled egg as each t cell disappears from my body it's replaced by 10 pounds of pressure you approach this with an approach and purpose mm -hmm. and experience in making films like this on some level with the Iraq film and then also a strategy. And you were able to make this film in a pretty efficient way, it feels yeah. like. Otherwise, you, you watch the film, you're like, well, if you had said, so 12 years ago, I started working on this film. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't have surprised me, you know? Well, I, you know, I think that's, 
That's the benefit of the TV experience. You know, like uh, I was the showrunner on the first four seasons of Drag Race. So, you know, when, when you're starting a show and then over the course of say one year, you, you know, you might go from nothing to, to shooting and editing and getting on the air 14 episodes. Like that's a very tight, confined schedule. And, and I will say that like the, the idea of entertaining ourselves in the edit bay. And when I say that, it's, it's, it's putting things together in a way that, that means something to us. And, you know, entertaining can be devastating. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be cheerful, but it's just whatever moves us. And I use entertaining as sort of a catch-all. But I think if things pop to, you know, pop to me or like, you know, I kind of trust that. And having a scene or a moment and being able to cram in all the emotion, you know, it might be both sad and funny and heartfelt or whatever. And, and I, I think all of that previous experience um, is very helpful. A man whose principles have been familiar to Americans for 30 years. A man whose accomplishments make him the natural choice for president of the United States. We will make America great again. Thank you very much. Reagan is the president of this country now. Going through a time in my life that seems desperate, surreal, awful, and slightly wondrous all simultaneously. And so the original kind of impetus or energy that kind of got you going in this direction was a new administration, the Trump administration being in and you being feeling how exactly? Well, just helpless and angry, you know, and I just... Helpless and angry. Helpless and angry. And I also, you know, these projects take so much out of you and, you know, you invest so much of my time and, you know, our time in them um, and you want them to mean something. And, you know, David, you know, not to the degree that I came to realize, but David just very quickly seemed like there would be things that spoke to the, you know, what was going on and make me feel like I was actually doing something proactive, even if it wasn't quite so in the moment. Um, my hope was that it, it would be meaningful in some way. And, and the deeper I got into, you know, his journals and the audio that he left behind, it just, you know, it turned out to be sort of like a perfect foil because so much of what he addressed and talked about in the 80s, you know, of course, is still a problem. The government has a day-to-day -day job maintaining an illusion of a one-tribe nation. And inside of that one-tribe nation, there's actually millions of tribes. Historically, minorities have always been expendable in this country. What is the parallel that you see from the AIDS epidemic in the 80s to the, the kind of, you know, political climate and pandemic that we've lived through over the last 18 months. Is well, you know, David was political throughout his life, even like before the AIDS crisis. And as he was coming into his own as an artist, um, there were a lot of social issues that um, brought, drew his attention. And a lot of his work is based on this idea that, you know, what he called America's one tribe nation mentality in our pre-invented existence. Trump was not the only indication. I mean, it had never gone away, these issues and the power struggle and the way, uh, you know, politicians and, and anyone in power sort of manipulate the masses to, to try to stay in power. And um, of course we know it's, you know, in, in, as David says in the film, you know, minorities in this country are dis disposable, um, whether they're black or brown or gay or, you know, as David says, junkies, you know, whatever it might be. And, you know, that, that so much of that seemed to really speak to what was going on. And as I was listening to David's tapes and, and, and going through the material, I was always kind of trying to listen for things that felt like they could have been from today. Is the fact that I may be dying of AIDS in 1989, is that not political? Is the fact that I don't have health insurance and I don't have access to adequate health care, is that not political? There are so many little parallels like that. He talks about drug testing, um, the AIDS drug testing before there were any cocktails or anything, and, and how you know they were testing on minority children and, and the way they were sort of conning parents into doing this and giving children placebos. The way he describes it in the film is like they were taking these kids from their parents, which at the time we were doing that was in the middle of you know all of that stuff going on with the, at the border and families being separated. Um, so it just felt, right. you know, really yeah. ripped from the headlines of the moment. They were strapping minority babies to beds and giving half of them placebos. Basically, they're stealing these babies from their parents. 
saying this is the only way your baby can get treatment, sign this form, killing half of them purposefully with placebos. The amount of archival that you had to go through, explain the process, you know, you, you got in touch with the, the, the kind of agents that represented his estate, mm -hmm. said you wanted to make a, a film, and then did they just give you this like, well, here's a treasure trove of everything. He recorded everything. Did you know going into it? I had some idea that there was stuff. I didn't know that it was going to be as amazing as it was. All of David's archive was being kept at Fales Library at NYU. They have sort of a downtown collection of various archives, but they've really made David's um, kind of a centerpiece uh, in terms of how they've cataloged it and, and made elements public. With the estate on board, we had access to everything. Um, and so I went to NYU probably over those couple years, I spent maybe four or five weeks total um, going through pages and pages and just photographing things on my phone. There were probably about 200 audio cassettes. And so they sent me um, everything that had already been digitized and each audio file represented like one half of an audio tape. So it was like 30 to 45 minutes. And those were his tape journals and, and the answering machine tapes, conversations he had with friends, that just street sounds he recorded walking around Times Square, a mixtape he made in Paris, which ended up being used for Three Teens Kill Four music, all sorts of things. And you know, once once I got that stuff, I just sort of, as that was coming in, I loaded the audio files onto my iPhone and I just walked around and listened to, to his tapes and sort of, you know, became acquainted with David, sort of started my relationship with David because I mean, it became very personal. I remember one of the most emotional experiences was one day being picked up by this guy who was very creepy. And I remember lying on this dirty bed that was one of these cheap hotels and this guy sucking my dick his mouth was sticky and that he would kiss my leg and there would be like this gummy kind of stuff on my leg. And it was all the stuff that I was really repulsed by and not enough to not have a heart on. I remember feeling all this incredible emotion for this guy. I just felt so sad for him that at some point I like reached under his arms and pulled him up to me and kissed him on the mouth, which is the thing that I least wanted to do. He started weeping and just said, nobody's ever done that and ended up giving me extra money and whatever, which I was quite happy with. But what was it like going through this deeply personal archive? It's almost like having, you know, someone's cell phone password and you can access their most personal thoughts and feelings. I mean, it was it was amazing. And, you know, the, the earliest tape is, is from when he was 21 and he was going cross country with a friend. And there was a, a sort of a, a substantial chunk, because he, he would record them off and on over the years. And the busier her, he got with his art, the less he did the tape journals. But there was sort of a big chunk from 1981, which I think actually represents probably a, a healthy amount of, of what we ended up using in the film. And so much of what was on those tapes sounded really relatable, I think, to anyone who is trying to find their way in the world, whether they're an artist or not. He was like 26 at the time, um, but also as an artist, wondering if what he was doing, you know, had any value, if he was any good, if it mattered in the world. And so much of the things he was discussing, you know, spoke to why I wanted to do, you know, why what I was looking for when I found sort of this as a, as a documentary topic. I can feel with this sense of, uh, of anxiousness and the fact that I'm 26 and thinking about myself and my values, and my actions, and thinking about the effect of people on people, wondering if any of it's meaningful, if it's futile, trying to figure out what it is that my life is and where I've been going. Little gems like that, I think it's, it's what people ended up relating to in the film because you know, David was a scary person. And even if people weren't aware of him and what little they have heard about him over the years, whatever rage he carried has become sort of the brand, which was a big part of it. But he was also, you know, sort of an intimate, sincere and funny person and all these things. And so much of that came out through the tapes and I'm wandering around. Tell me more about the tapes, specifically the answering machine tapes. Um, well, the, you know, the answering machine tapes were another surprise find. Hours and hours and hours of these answering machine tapes. You know, Peter Hujar, who is so important in David's life and such a big part of the story, is only in the film through those answering machine tapes. <laughs> 
and so much of their relationship and the the their interaction comes just from the giddiness and the goofiness that um, you know Peter puts in there, and, and to be able to kind of bring him to life through those was really unexpected and a blessing. Holy do, holy do. This is huge arena again. I was wondering if David Steam Vegetable was there. This is Peter Fast Juice. And the same with. Uh, David's sister, Pat, who passed away a few years ago, um, and I, I did not get to interview. And she's on the Answering Machine tapes. And again, like th just these little snippets, I think you can, you can hear their relationship. It's very personal. It's almost, in some ways, more, almost more personal than, well, it's not, I mean, David puts a lot out there in the, those tape journals, but some of it is as personal because again, Sometimes it's just the tone of their voice in the end when she calls yep. and it's near the end of his life and, and she's saying that, you know, he, she's coming to town, but, she, you know, she hopes he has, you know, someone around him. Yep. And you can hear that, it, you know, she, that she's getting emotional on the other end and it's a subtle thing, but it's there. I just want to let you know, I talked to Tom and I told him when I'm coming in, I'm worried about you. I hope I just hope that you have someone around you, and, uh, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Big kiss. Bye-bye. I will say that one of the things I love, you know, because David is such a very disruptive, um, you know, a lot of the work is very aggressive in, in various ways. And, you know, there's that moment in the film where David's reading the text on the painting that features his photographs of uh, Peter Hujar after he had passed away. And David's reading this text and shouting it. And as that's going on, you know, we have this little low beep and you hear this like, David, David. And, and, you know, and then this like, David. At the moment, I'm a 37 foot tall, 1,172 pound man inside this six foot body. David. And all I can feel is the pressure. David. All I can feel is the pressure and the need for release. David, it's Pat. And it's, she's trying to see if he's going to answer the phone, but it's like this loud moment and this soft little voice is suddenly disrupting in the film. The answering machine tapes were great transitions because we realized that anytime we kind of were, wanted to move on to the next thing but didn't really have a way in, we could just throw in a phone call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like a natural break that people understand. You know, they're, they're used to their lives sort of being interrupted by a call. That also provides more context and yeah. layers to the story as well. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to put a label on him, but he's just, he's so punk, Wojnarowicz, yeah. you know? It's just like the political nature of his work, the, but he didn't, when, when the art world started embracing him, his reaction to that was not like, okay, now this is my opportunity to, to cash in and sell out. He seemed very, very authentic and consistent in his ideals and beliefs and his conviction of them. Yeah, you know, he certainly, at, you know, 85 became this really big year. He was in the Whitney Biennial and he got this um, huge sort of um, commission to do this Mnuchin uh, installation. David didn't really like rich people. <laughs> so he took all this garbage off of the street and put it into the installation. Love it. And and yeah. Yeah, right, he had had a really hard life up to that point. Always broke, um, not the healthiest from from sort of that like malnourished and, and struggling on the street childhood and and things like that. And so suddenly, when he had money to not have it quite so rough, it it gave him an opportunity to to consider these things and wonder about these assholes who were paying for it, you know. And that really pissed him off. Of course, he wanted his work out there, and the Whitney Biennial is a huge showcase for an artist who's only been painting for two years. Um, but you know, he also didn't like the the people that it attracted. And you know, as, as he says, you know, art like history is made for certain people. You know, it's kept for certain people. And and what he did in his work was try to speak to his own history um, and present a different kind of history. You know, those stories less told speak to how you know we bring down the system by putting ourselves into our work it does confront this this idea of a one tribe nation and it robs the the people who control the media and control history and the books of 
being able to say this is the only thing. So towards the end of the film, you have the scene of his funeral uh, in 1992, and it says his funeral was, was the first political funeral of the AIDS era. What does that actually mean? That was something that was brought up in his biography, that Cynthia Carr, who um, had been there at the time, that's where I think the idea came from for me. And certainly, I think at, that was, I think the first time that people took to the streets for a particular person who had passed away from AIDS. And the protest was really tied to this specific loss. After that, the, it cert, the idea certainly expanded. There were, there, there were, you know, there were corpses, you know, there were dead people in coffins who were paraded, you know, in Washington and, and I think New York at the time. And, and certainly the idea of a political funeral expanded and uh, became, I think, a much sharper weapon. I don't need this from you. I don't need this kind of insult. I fucking face this every day. And I don't need it from quote unquote family. You understand? Well, this is a conversation end, Steve. We never see each other again. Goodbye. Why do you think he was recording everything? Do you think he had an inkling that one day these tapes would be heard? Or was it a form of paranoia or ego or narcissism? You know, I think David did consider that um, these audio tapes and journals may be used at some point. And based on, on things he said on the tapes and, and his sort of general attitude about things along the way, I think he was probably conflicted about that. But he was also, I think, very aware, you know, he had the model of Peter Hujar in his life, um, in his mentorship through all things. And when Peter died, as Fran says in the film, you know, there were seven people that probably could tell you who Peter Hujar was. And, um, and the head of his, um, state now says, you know, he was a saint on Avenue A, but nobody knew who he was. David, like all of us, you know, it's like this conflict of like, you, you want your work to be known, you want to be attached to it. There's a problem with that when it does happen and it freaks you out. Or, you know, even when, when he gained fame sort of in the mid 80s and, and suddenly as, as he was getting attention, it became this new struggle for him. And, you know, there were things he destroyed sort of in, in the months and in, um, leading up to his death in a few years, pieces and things that he didn't want out there, but he didn't get rid of this stuff. And so I think he, he was aware of, I think, how, how it might be, you know, might be useful for his legacy. Um, in what way? Probably didn't know. Um, did he feel great about that? Was he convinced that was a good thing? Mm -hmm, I bet not, um, but enough to keep it around and to, 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 to let it exist. It seems that the art world at a certain point embraces David, but did he also make the art world nervous or scare the art world a little bit? And then he has his controversy with the NEA. Yeah, I mean, I think David did uh, scare the art world for sure. Um, both in, you know, what his art covered, but also I think dealing with him personally. So th that certainly contributed to, 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 to you know, their, their feelings about him. And, you know, with the NEA, at the time, they had been, they had gone after Maplethorpe. They had gotten his show canceled at the Corcoran in Washington. There was the controversy with Andre Serenos, Piss Christ. And so when the witnesses against our vanishing, which was the beginning of his, his troubles with the NEA and, and sort of censorship, it's interesting that for this visual artist, the issue, he was also a writer, and the issue came from the essay that he had uh, in the book, in the, in the program for, for the, the show, the catalog. And it was his words and thoughts, you know, pure on the page that, that really caused the issue. And, and, you know, initially caused the NEA to pull the grant from, which was only, you know, $15,000, pull the grant from, from the, the gallery and the show. And then that January was, the retrospective that they had in normal Illinois around his life. And, and then that, everything kind of snowballed from there because it the show drew more attention. That catalog, now for the, for the actual visual art, 
um, became sort of the, the focus of controversy and, and the focus of attacks on his work. There were questions about why the money was going to this, all the way up to the White House, where George Bush had sent this note to the head of the NEA um, asking about this image of Jesus shooting Jesus up shooting heroin. Up. Yeah. And, and that it, it's interesting, that whole controversy from that point on, and the, the thing with the American Family Association and um, Donald Wildman, it was never about the entirety of any piece of art. And, you know, most of the work were collages. So they would take some little portion of it. And it, you know, it might be 5% of the overall piece, but it was this focus um, that would draw the attention. And there were several pieces that they had just kind of clipped little, it was like, like a ransom note, cut and pasted sections out and, and made this flyer um, and sent it to like every member of Congress and to, to you know, various Christian factions. It's Barry Blinderman, who was the curator of the retrospective and coincidentally the owner of Fuck You Faggot Fucker, the painting, um, you know, says in the film that the image of, you know, Jesus shooting himself up was representative of, you know, Jesus taking on the pain and suffering of humans. And like, that's what that meant. And it's like, well, if, if Jesus were walking around today in lower Manhattan, you know, he would be with the junkies and the people who needed him most. And, you know, in some ways that's what that represented. I'd end up having contests with them about who could quote the Bible better, me or them trying to explain to them that Jesus was the man of sorrows and he was here to cleanse us of our sins. And if that meant taking on the pain of a junkie, then that's what Christ would have to do. What was the kind of message that you were trying to get across in this film? In the end, it, it was about how, you know, the importance of art and putting ourselves in our work. And, and you know, at the end of the film, David says, uh, if the work we make as artists doesn't contribute to the resistance, we're helping a system of control become more perfect. The message of the film and the, and the closing of the film is, is about sort of inspiring, David putting himself in his work and using that as, as a means to sort of, you know, bring down the system and, 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 you know, as he says in the film, when we put ourselves in our work, we apply a tiny amount of pressure um, on a system of control that would willing, willingly jump into fascism if, we didn't, if there wasn't enough pressure on its throat. I never would have voiced it that way, but that's certainly like, you know, what I kind of hoped um, in a very eloquent way. Um, and and I, I think that does come across in the film. And I, th I think that we don't try to whitewash or, um, you know, soften his opinions of things and, 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 and try to, even calling the film, you know, fuck you faggot fucker was, I think the, the thing that's most true to David and, and putting it out there and, and, and um, in the way that, you know, he sort of reclaimed it from this little piece of graffiti um, to make this beautiful piece of art. Um, it seemed like a, a perfect way to label the film that for people who might not know who David is, probably can't say his name when they see the title, <laughs> but you know, in the places that are using the tagline, they see fuck you faggot fucker, and you know, they, they know they're in for something raw and, and possibly violent. The film was supposed to premiere at Tribeca um, in 2020, and, and after it was accepted, we had to kind of give them the full title, and we always knew we were gonna have some kind of tagline, subtitle, but we didn't know what it was. I sort of threw it out in a meeting, and if Randy and, F well actually, Fenton, instantly was like, yes, that's it. And Randy was like, oh, I don't know. And then by the next day, he was like, yes. Um, you know, so they, World of Wonder, they were always on board because that, that's also very much in their spirit of like, you know, uh, a, a lack of creative self-censorship and, you know, mm -hmm. pushing the boundaries. Um, but, you know, from that point forward, you know, it was picked up by Kino Lorber. And as they're marketing the film, I think, you know, I'm sure very rightly, were concerned all along the way that the, that, that title would be problematic and, and sort of not, allow to get the exposure that one would hope. Um, and then, you know, a few months ago at, at the Met Gala, Dan Levy wore Fuck You Faggot Fucker. He had the two boys kissing and all this stuff and suddenly everyone didn't use it, but suddenly without asterisks, that was popping up in, in you know, very respectable and, and uh, unexpected places. You know, look, people are very protective of, of David's legacy, not just the estate, but of course the estate who ha had to approve that. But I think people, who knew David and also, you know, generations of not just queer, but 
specifically queer people who, you know, idolize David in, in the work that he did, that feel very protective. And, you know, some people weren't so keen on his work being sort of boiled down into this, this fat piece of fashion um, and put on a runway by, you know, sort of a, a big uh, star. But at the same time, you know, that was the day before David's birthday. And on David's birthday, more people across the country were saying David's name than would have been otherwise. And would he have approved? Maybe not, but if he were still alive, there would be 40 years of, 30 years of David putting his name out there and creating new work. And it would have been a non-issue, but I, you know, I think it's, it's been hard. It's like 30 years after his death, still not the most known artist for, for a variety of reasons. Um, his name, uh, the work, not just because it's challenging, but it's not easily identifiable. You know, it's not a Keith Haring, which you see Keith Haring and you know it's a Keith Haring. It's not, you know, somebody getting fisted. It's not a Maple Fork piece. And, and, and so it's not, very little of it feels that iconic. And, and I think for that reason, it, it's, you know, made his legacy harder to, to perpetuate. Um, so to me, Something like that, I think, is, is beneficial, even if it, you know, isn't the ideal. I mean, and, and certainly, I mean, I can't say that I was unhappy that suddenly people were saying, fuck, you know, the title of the film eight months after it came out. Wojnarowicz is, you know, an artist who expressed himself through many different mediums, writing, photography, painting, music, which speaks to you the most. I, you know, I think it's the entirety of his life and it's all of these pieces of work and in the way that making the film felt collaborative because of the way David would reuse things in his work I think it's hard to separate what was the most successful because certain things were reused and used in, in different ways and it was it was almost like an it, you know all hands on deck onslaught of all of his ideas and all of his work and him trying to figure out reworking ideas and, and trying to you know find new ways to, to make it successful even the idea of the sewn mouth is something that came up through David's work much earlier in the paintings and, and some of the, you know, he did these sculptural heads. And so I, I you know, I think it, it's kind of hard to, to separate and say any one thing is, is the most successful. I love the idea that you felt like you were actually collaborating with Wojnarowicz on this film. Yeah, and I was, I mean, throughout it, I was one of the big inspirations was trying to get David not to like haunt me or come back and get me, you know? Fortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, but I definitely, it definitely felt like he was with us because as I said, there were problems that we would encounter and the solution always came from David, you know, mm -hmm. um, from, the, from the tape journals in interesting ways. Do you um, feel like he would have been happy with the film? Um, I like to think so. Um, I, it's hard for me to, to I, like, I, I could never go around and say, well, David would love this film. People that know him, I've been told by, by people that knew him that, you know, they, they think he would approve, and that means a lot to me. It's so aggressive that, you know, it's got fuck you faggot in the title. I don't know how many documentaries have a rim job in it, but like all the reasons in the world that it would not be well received by the New York Times or New Yorker or these like establishment things, that, you know, the, the places that, uh, you know, David, would instantly see the value in and instantly be pissed about, which is great. Confront the state.